big hand. Amen. Uh, ushers, give them a great big hand. Amen. Amen. Give our ushers a great big hand. Amen. Our musicians a great big hand. Amen. Turn to your Bibles to Luke, the 15th chapter. The 15th chapter. The 15th chapter. Just turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, he won't be long. Say, he won't be long. Say, he'll be just like Elizabeth Taylor. One husband after the other. <laughs> Amen. One of my favorite stories is the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son. It is a marvelous, marvelous story because it tells us about how this young boy becomes prodigal. He leaves from his father's house goes out into the far country. And the text says that while he is out there, he involves himself into what is called riotous living. Say riotous living. And at the end of the day, he finds himself in the hog pen of life. You know, when you're out there too long and you stay there too long, you'll find yourself in a place that you don't want to be. At the end of the day, he takes his father's inheritance and wastes it away. And then you remember the story, how he remembers the fact that he has a father. And that's what God always wants us to remember, that we always have a father. The other day, a lady came into my office. She had a very serious kind of a problem that she had committed what she called a grave sin. And at the end of the day, I said to her, God loves you. God wants you. God will never abandon you because the Bible says that God would never leave us nor forsake us. And after hearing the fact that God loved her, you could see a whole shift in her very spirit when she was reminded that no matter how far she sinned, go astray, that God still loved her. The prodigal son remembered that. And the text says very quickly that he remembers the fact that he has a father who has much. And so he prays, you remember, prays that he might return to his father and that his father would only accept him in no longer as a son but as a hired servant. He thought he was not good enough any longer like that sister thought she was not good enough any longer for, for God because of the sin she had committed. The text says that he gets up out of the hog pen gets up out of the hog pen. If you find yourself stuck somewhere you've got to learn how to get up and get out. Have I got a witness in the house? You've got to learn how to get up and get out of whatever it is that have you stuck in life. He gets up, he gets out, heads back home to his father. And the text says, you remember, that when he is headed towards his father's house, his father was out there looking and waiting for him. Say looking and waiting for him. His father was waiting for reconciliation. His father was waiting for his son to return. And so he was out there looking for him. It's the same scenario in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve had failed and suddenly they began to clothe themselves with leaves to hide themselves out from God. The text says that in the evening, in the cool of the evening, that God comes walking, looking for Adam and ultimately he makes that marvelous question. He says, Adam, where are you? Say, Adam, where are you? God is always concerned where we are at. God is always concerned what we're doing. God is always concerned about how we're doing, what we're doing. He's always concerned and he's always out there waiting, asking the question, Adam, where are you? Say, Adam, where are you? But here is the verse I want us to highlight today in verse 13, especially on this Martin Luther King Jr. weekend and holiday that we need to remind ourselves of the great sacrifices of this man by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. The text says in verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey. Not many days after, say not many days after. In other words, there was a movement here. There was a movement. There was a movement. The young son makes a movement. He makes a movement. When I think in terms of Martin Luther King Jr., that's all he was doing. During his short 39 years of life, he was constantly making 
making movements. Say making movements. He was constantly making movements. Say movements. He was moving from one place to another. He was going from one place to another. In 39 years, he did more in his short lifetime than most of us who are 70 plus live in our lifetime. You remember, it's, the movement begins really when he is 15 years of age. Here is, a, here is a young kid who graduates from high school at 15 years of age. He goes to Morehouse College, graduates there in sociology, moves on to Crozier in Pennsylvania, graduates there in theology with his master's degree, goes on to Boston University, and at the tender young age of 29, he now holds an earned PhD. But then something happens after he earns the PhD there in Montgomery, where he is now pastoring the Dexter Avenue, say Dexter Avenue, Baptist Church in about December. You remember that there is this great bus protest and boycott that occurred because there's, there's this seamstress by the name of Rosa Park who has been unfairly dealt with by way of the bus driver. She was asked to move to the back of the bus. When the truth of the matter is, she was already in the legal section of the bus. You know, in those days, you could be in certain sections of the bus. There were three rows in the front area that was available to people, and so Nick Rose could sit in uh, the certain section of the front section of the bus. But when the bus got filled, they demanded people illegally to get up and give up their seats to folk of other color. Rosa Parks refused to do so. She was tired. She had been working all day long, and she had been asked time and time to give up her seat. And she says, for some odd reason, she does not really know why, she, she decided that she was not going to give up her seat this time. They arrest her, put her in jail. And this seamstress calls her pastor. Her pastor is the president of the local NAACP, and she is the secretary of the NAACP in Montgomery, Alabama. They get together and they call on Martin Luther King Jr. to lead this great protest, the Montgomery Improvement Association. And for more than 365 days, they refuse to ride the buses. And ultimately, when they won the bus boycott, they began to use Dr. King to move here and to go there. He moves from here. He goes to Montgomery. He goes to Salma. He even goes up north to Chicago, comes to Cleveland. Later on, in 1965, 67, he is here at the Cory United Methodist Church. And then comes that great moment, that great moment in 1963, August 28th, a sweltering hot day, he stands up and he, and he says to the folk, I have a dream. Can you turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you need a dream. Say, neighbor, do you remember dreaming and what you were dreaming about? All of us ought to have a dream. Just turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, have you forgot your dreams? There was a man by the name of Edwin Markham. Edwin Markham said that we glory, that, that all that we glory was once a dream. But then 1968, April 4th, he goes on the balcony. You remember that his dream is shattered. Say his dream is shattered. Yes, there is this crazed assassin across the street who sh guns him down while he is outside on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. He's really at a high point in his ministry. He's really at a high point in his ministry. He is still the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You know, you've got to watch out when you find yourself in high places. Because the truth of the matter is, the moment you move to high places, there's always somebody who won't take you down. They don't want to take you down when you're in low places. They don't want to take you down when things are not really rough, uh, when things are rough and tough. But when you get to a high place in life, 
you'll always find those other folk who want to take you down. And the people who want to take you down are not always people on the outside. Sometimes they're people right in your own family. Does anybody have anybody inside of their family that really today still want to take you down? Well, you say, Reverend, they don't want to take me down. Well, if they don't want to take you down, they certainly don't want to see you up. It's the crab mentality. They're always trying to pull you back in the barrel. To pull you down. Martin King was at a high place in his ministry. And all of a sudden, folk all around him wanted this king dead. The other day, uh, I was on the air on Channel 3. And they asked me a question. They said, uh, J. Edgar Hoover had said that Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the dangerous, most dangerous men in America. And I said to the person, I said, uh, I said to the, the, the person who was interviewing me, I said to him, I said, he was the most dangerous person in America. You're looking at me strange right now. The truth of the matter is Martin King was getting ready to shut down the economy, not like, not like Donald Trump and the Senate. And even the Congress, I'll be honest with you, at this point, get a man the wall. I'd rather people go back to work. Because the wall is not going to make any difference anywhere it goes. But when you put $6 billion in that wall, once you put $6 billion in the inner cities also, and in children and old people and all of that as well. Have I got a witness? At least I got one person that said amen. He was flying high, but he was cut short. Here it is. Point number one. Say point number one. All of us are to have a dream. We used to dream, didn't we? Yes, when we were children, growing up, we used to have a dream. Uh, the first thing uh, mama used to give us, uh, our little girls used to give our little girls a kitchenette set, a little house, and some doll babies. Not the American dolls, they couldn't afford those. But they would give them a little, a little kitchenette and they would give them a, a little house that they would play in, dollhouse, and they would give them dolls. What was they trying to do? Get the child to dream of the fact that one day you ought to want your own home and family. And so they dreamed of a home and a family. We used to dream. When it came down to boys, we used to give them little cars and carrying on, you know, racing cars. I gave Daniel so many of them, I, I, I don't know where he put all those cars at, but I gave him all those cars because I wanted him to learn how to handle dealing with changing tires. How do you change oil? Mechanic kind of a work. The truth of the matter is all of us used to have dreams. We used to dream of church what church would be like, what it would be like to have the fellowship, what it would be like to have a great choir like Mount Zion Church, what it meant to have ushers like Mount Zion Church, musicians like at Mount Zion has a great pastor, good God from Zion, that Mount Zion has. It opens up the church when it's 15 inches of snow out there. Uh, we dreamed of a great church. We dreamed of walking with each other. We dreamed of the brotherhood and the sisterhood. We dreamed of a place where everybody was somebody, where the degrees were left at the front door. And at the end of the day, when you walked in, everybody was somebody. We dreamed of a great church. What has happened to our dream? Beethoven, the great composer, would walk around in the woods dreaming about composing great symphonies out there in the woods. Someone said that every great advancement of history started with a dream, using the eye of imagination. Say the eye of imagination. Martin Luther King Jr. used the eye of imagination. He could see what we couldn't see. It was like the prodigal son. The truth of the matter is he was already in the far country even before he ever got to the far country. He had dreamed of going into a far country even before he ever got there. That's what dreaming is all about. It's about the imagination. Say the imagination. And dreams. Martin Luther King Jr. stood uh, in Washington, D.C. on the steps there in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And he had already dreamed. Say he had already dreamed. He already dreamed of civil rights. And he had said uh, that 100 years 
after being freed by Abraham Lincoln, if you will, it's time for us to have our civil rights, and Negroes ought to have their civil rights in America. And in 1964, we received the civil rights. He had already dreamed that Americans everywhere ought to have voting right. I think he dreamed that. I think he dreamed wrong there because uh, nobody wants to vote today. But, but he dreamed of, of voting rights. And in 1965, he receives the voting right bill. He was constantly dreaming. And, and he was getting ready to shut down Washington, D.C. He was getting ready to wa shut down Washington, D.C. Hold up now. Hold up. Don't go too fast. He was getting ready to shut down Washington, D.C. In the economic summit for an economic uh, uh, bill of justice. Okay, so he wanted everybody to have a fair job. He wanted everybody to have money, if you will. And so he was getting ready to shut down. He's going to have 250. No, he's going to have not 250,000 there. He was going to have millions of people to just stand in the streets of Washington and shut it down. But what you need to also understand is that everybody ought to have a dream, but all dreams cannot always be trusted. Martin Luther King's dream turned into a nightmare, if you will, in 1965 when he goes to Los Angeles, watches riots, and discover that there were people who were in charge of Los Angeles that just didn't really care about a certain group of people. Though Rodney King was not yet on the scene, the truth is a lot of folk were being killed and beaten like Rodney King, and Martin King saw his dream turned into a nightmare. Sometimes dreams are just illusions or deceptions, which means that you have to have the right dream. Sometimes dreams are nightmare. How many of us have woke up, sweat-filled, eyes watered because we thought what was happening to us only a moment ago was actually a nightmare? And some of us even daydream. You're some of us daydream. I used to daydream all the time in school, Dan. In my Spanish class, my name was Lorenzo, which means Larry in Spanish. And my teacher used to always say, Lorenzo, wake up. Because she knew I was daydreaming. Well, she didn't know I was thinking about the little girls at that time. <laughs> Have mercy, Jesus. I was thinking about Marilyn. <laughs> Let me close. Dreams can be rewarding when they cooperate in conjunction with the will of God. One of Martin Luther King Jr.'s favorite phrase was, I just want to do God's will. The text says that the prodigal son, the younger son, had a great dream. He, he wanted to go into the far country. Wasn't nothing wrong with that. He wanted to go into the distant land. He wanted to go to the New York, Chicago of his day. And God wants all of us to go into distant land. He does want us to go into far country. He wants us to go so far into far country until we find ourselves in the kingdom of God. That's where we're at. We're in the far country, in the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus kept talking about. He kept talking about the kingdom of heaven is like this. He wanted us to go into the far country. But, but in the far country, he wants us to be faithful. Say faithful. And that's why I congratulate you. You came into the far country in a very real sense this day when it was snowing like it's snowing and slipping and sliding because you wanted to be in the kingdom of God. Wasn't nothing wrong with him going into the far country. But he allowed the wrong far country to get inside of him. And that's what he does not want to see happen to us. Have I got a witness? But at the end of the day, when you're in this far country, where God says, I want to make you a disciple, a follower of Jesus. When you're in this far country that leads you to another far country called heaven or the place of eternity with God. He says, there's always rewards when you're faithful in the far country. What was wrong with this brother? He was not faithful in the far country. What did he do? He wasted his goods in wasteful lifestyle. And he spent all that he had rather than invest them into the kingdom of God. Let's stand on our feet right now. God will always reward you 
when you stay faithful in wherever you find yourself at. Some people will say King was never rewarded, that he died a very terrible death on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. But think about it. He was rewarded. In 81, they took the Lorraine Motel and turned it into a museum, the place that Dr. King died. In 83, behind the Ebenezer Church, they created the Nonviolence Center in honor of Dr. King. In 87, they created a national holiday in his name. And then in 2011, what did they do? They built a Martin Luther King monument right next to FDR Roosevelt's monument around the corner from Abraham Lincoln's monument right across the Potomac River of the George Washington monument not far from the White House and the Capitol. Don't tell me if you don't, if you remain faithful unto God, God will reward you. Has anybody in the house been rewarded? by God. Come on, give God some praise. If you believe God, we'll reward you. Peter one time came to Jesus and said, Jesus, lo, we have given up everything for you. We have given up all for you. And you're talking about leaving us in John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, ye may be also. Where are you going, said Peter? We've given up everything. We need you to stay here a little longer. What are we going to get out of it for following you? Listen to the response of Jesus. Fairly I say to you, there is no man who has left house or parents or brother or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive much more in the present time and in the world to come life everlasting we get a whole lot serving the Lord does pay off after a while can you give high five to somebody and tell them serving the Lord does pay off it, it does pay off God says nowhere in the world are you gonna sacrifice for me no way in the world are you gonna work for me no way in the world are you gonna serve me and not receive much more We've been blessed because we've been serving God. Serving the Lord shall pay off. Not only now, but after a while. And then after that, God's going to say, come on up higher. Servant of God, you've been faithful over a few things. Come on up higher and I will make you ruler over many things. I got shoes, you got shoes, all of God's children got shoes. When we get to heaven, we're going to put on our shoes and we're going to walk all over God's heaven. I got a crown, you got a crown, all of God's children got a crown. When we get to heaven, we're going to put on our crown. I got a robe, you got a robe, all of God's children got a robe. When we get to heaven, going to put on our white robe and we're going to dance and shout all over God's heaven in a city where we never grow old in a city where we don't have to worry about the water bill because there is a river in the midst of the city the water is clear and cold we don't have to worry about grocery bills because there is a tree in the midst of the city that bears 12 manners of fruit 12 months out of a year we'll be eating in glory over there over there I've got a mansion you've got a mansion in the sky if it were not so the Lord would never have told us so he said what you've got to do is just be faithful go to church when it's 12 or 15 inches of snow out there go to church when the news folks say it's level one two or three come on to church anyhow sing in the choir worship the lord praise him read your bible because serving the lord does pay off martin king got a whole lot more in death than he did in life museum in memphis 
museum in Atlanta, Georgia. A holiday so folk will never forget his sacrifice. And a Lincoln and a Martin Luther King Memorial right there in Washington, D.C. Because he kept on serving the Lord. Come on, bow your heads and just give grace, prayer to God. Thank God for Martin Luther King Jr. and his mighty acts and his mighty works. God will always reward us. He will always take care of us. He will always do what no other power on earth can do. He will always make a way out of no way. And we need to give him thanks right now. The Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise God. Could you pray not only for having the dreamer here, but pray for the dream and the many other things that Dr. King said and wrote. He had a marvelous work, a book, where he challenges us, where do we go from here? From chaos or community? We're in chaos right now, but God wants to put us in a place called community where we are united with each other. Would you pray for the government right now? Don't blame one or the other, blame them all. Would you pray for all of those many workers who are furloughed? Pray that God will open up the government himself. Before the week is ended, we can pray that down. Pray for the families who are suffering. And if you know of a family, especially in our church, who is having a hard time, a single parent mother with her children struggling to even provide food, tell her to call Mount Zion and we'll make sure that not only food, but other kinds of things will be taken care of that single parent mother. That's what Mount Zion does. That's what we always do. If you're here today, you want to unite with the fellowship, there's a card. Or you can go right today to the Welcome Center. Meet